actually. So uh, let's think about a new functional group. This is what's called a carbonyl. This is what's called a carbonyl. Carbonyl. It's a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. A carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Now, there are actually many different types of carbonyls. So we don't actually usually name something as a carbonyl. We say what type of carbonyl it is. So for example, you might have a carbonyl bonded to a hydrogen and a carbon chain. A carbonyl bonded to a hydrogen and a carbon chain. Have you guys learned the name for this? It actually turns out to be something different, although it looks a little like that. Carboxylic acids are also carbonyls, but this is what's called an aldehyde. Oh. So this is an aldehyde. Yeah, it's attached to a carbon chain and... And one hydrogen. One hydrogen. Aldehyde yes. means one carbon chain and one hydrogen attached to the carbonyl carbon. Okay, so this is an aldehyde. Um, and another possibility is this. What's this carbonyl carbon attached to? Two carbon chains. Two carbon chains. This is called a ketone. A carbonyl attached to two carbon chains is called a ketone. Uh, yeah, there could be substituents on them. All that matters is that the atom is directly connected to the carbonyl on the left should be a carbon, and the atom is directly connected on the right should be a carbon. And then there could be any interesting things you like on the rest of the carbon chain. That's a good point. It's good to be specific about that. So remember, these are both types of carbonyls. An aldehyde is one type of carbonyl, and a ketone is another type of carbonyl. So if you looked at this, it wouldn't be very helpful to say it's a carbonyl. It would be more useful to be specific and say it's an aldehyde. All right? Now, how about this guy? Now, this is kind of a special case. Notice that this is a tiny little molecule with just one carbon. All right, well, it turns out that this is considered to be an aldehyde as well. So this would also be considered an aldehyde. This is the smallest aldehyde possible, of course, because it only has one carbon. So I said before that an aldehyde had, is a carbonyl connected to a hydrogen and a carbon chain, but there also is one special case where you just have two hydrogens that are attached. So that just has to be memorized separately. But all the other examples have a hydrogen and one carbon chain. So this would be another aldehyde. Okay? So those are aldehydes. Earlier somebody mentioned a carboxylic acid. This is the carboxylic acid. So here we have a carboxylic acid. So a carboxylic acid is a carbon attached to a carbon chain and a hydroxy, uh, where we have a carbonyl carbon attached to a carbon chain and a hydroxy. Uh, maybe I should say, technically speaking, actually, I guess this could be a hydrogen, although that doesn't come up too much. This could be a hydrogen or a carbon chain over here. Okay, these have to be carbon chains, otherwise these would be aldehydes, but uh, sometimes R stands for hydrogen, like it could look here. Okay, so that's a carboxylic acid. By the way, what do acids do? Do they steal protons or uh, give protons? Give protons. Yeah, well, who's the acidic proton here then? This is the acidic proton, not one of the protons on the carbons, obviously. So it's good to know this is the acidic proton. This is the proton that tends to be given. Carboxylic acids are not strong acids. They don't completely deprotonate. They only partially deprotonate. A strong acid would be something like hydrochloric acid. So this is a, a fairly weak acid. All right, so this would be a carboxylic acid. Obviously, it's an acid because it has the word acid in its name. So now we've learned about three different types of carbonyls. These are the three types of carbonyls you need to know about. 
Next semester, you learn about different types of carbon yields, but these are the only carbon yields you need for this semester. Carboxylic acid, aldehyde, and ketone. So again, when possible, you don't want to just say something's a carbon yield, you want to be more specific and say what type of carbon yield um, it is. These are our types uh, over here. Again, that these are two separate steps. So this is a predict the products problem, where we're going to add first this reagent and then this reagent. So let's try to put in some electron pushing arrows and figure out what's going to happen. Okay, let's proceed together now. So you're both doing some things right and uh, some things you need to work on. So uh, we're going to start by taking this covalent bond and erasing it and putting in charges. And then we can immediately put this negative charge at the tail. You know, we always put the green yard at the tail. So then the question is, who should go at the head? Who should go at the head of this arrow? So it looked like there was a difference of opinion between the two of you because one of you put the head on this hydrogen and one of you put the head on this carbon. So we should decide which of those is the best place for the head to go. Well, first of all, um, why would it seem reasonable for the head of the... Uh, uh, well, I guess one of you thought that it would go to the hydrogen. That is, you thought that this would be acting like a base, right, and deprotonating. Now, do you remember what types of things are Grignard's good at deprotonating? What types of atoms? Yeah, oxygen and other electronegative atoms. Bases are good at deprotonating electronegative atoms. Bases are good at deprotonating electronegative atoms. Okay, so are bases good at deprotonating carbons? No, because carbons are not electronegative atoms. Spaces are not good at deprotonating carbons. You can, you can see that if you go back to the examples that we did previously. Um, well, I guess we won't uh, go into that right now. But anyway, I would simply say that um, we haven't shown green yards deprotonating any carbons. Green yards don't deprotonate carbons. They deprotonate electronegative atoms, especially oxygens. Okay. So um, another way to put that is that carbons are not acidic at all. Carbons are not acidic at all, so they don't react with bases. Carbons are not acidic at all, so they don't react with bases. Electronegative atoms tend to be more acidic. They're not really good acids, but they're more acidic than carbons, so they can react with a very strong base. Okay. Why was it so tempting to attack this hydrogen here? Well, because we usually don't draw hydrogens, so your attention was kind of drawn to this hydrogen over here, right? Usually we don't draw hydrogens. Why did we draw this one? Because it's the, well, do you guys remember what's the name of this functional group? We know it's a carbonyl, but what type of carbonyl is it? Um, aldehyde. Yeah, it's an aldehyde. So we've seen in the past that we usually do not draw hydrogens that are attached to carbons. Those are the hidden hydrogens. However, the convention is that we usually do draw aldehyde hydrogens. We usually do draw the aldehyde hydrogen. Remember, by definition, an aldehyde has to have a hydrogen. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an aldehyde. An aldehyde is a carbonyl that's attached on one side to a hydrogen. So the convention is that in ordinary carbon, we usually don't show the hydrogens, even though it wouldn't be wrong to. But the convention is that we usually do show the aldehyde hydrogen. Uh, but that doesn't mean it has any special significance. In fact, um, I cannot think of a single reaction that the aldehyde hydrogen participates in that you'll see through both semesters. So through the entire course, all semest two semesters, I don't think you will ever do a reaction with the aldehyde hydrogen. We draw it just because that's the conventional thing to do, but it's not going to do anything interesting. All right, so we're not going to react with that aldehyde hydrogen. We certainly are not going to deprotonate it. So let's try the other suggestion. The other suggestion was to put the head of the arrow on the carbonyl carbon. By the way, what's a good name for this carbon? A good name for this carbon is the carbonyl carbon. So I'm going to use that term a lot. This is the carbonyl carbon over here. Uh, that would be reasonable. Why is it reasonable for this carbon to act like an electrophile? Because the double bond to oxygen, it's making it um, electro electron 
That's right. And, and the best way to express that is in terms of charges, although what you said is correct. So this is a carbon with a delta positive. In fact, I think that you actually drew that on your uh, document, on your page. That was good. We know what are, what are our, our electrophiles? Electrophiles tend to be carbons with full or partial positive charges. Electrophiles tend to be carbons with full or partial positive charges. Here we have a carbon with a partial positive charge. This is a very good uh, guy for us to attack over here. All right, so this, uh, this charge could come in uh, like this. Now, this carbon already has a full octet. That carbon already has a full octet, so you must break a bond at the same time you're forming a bond. And it looked like you uh, already knew that we break this pi bond. That means the electrons, you never have two arrows pointing to the same place. So this arrow has to be pointing away from the carbon, towards the oxygen over here. Um, so just to be ultra clear about what's happening, the green yard is donating its lone pair to the carbonyl carbon. And then we're going to move the pair of electrons in that pi bond up to the oxygen. You don't need to draw the pairs, but that's a good habit. 